Okay, hey, I just want to thank all the mayors and the champions and the, uh, all of the distinguished guests that have come uh, today. I know that there's a much bigger event following this that's much more important than you looking at me talking because uh, you get to recognize all those great volunteers that, are, that do so much for us uh, every single day. So I appreciate you all taking some time uh, out just to uh, talk to us. And uh, I want to thank you all again for the support that you show us uh, at Fort Campbell. It, it resonates over here. I can tell you that for a fact. I appreciate all the emails uh, that you all send. Uh, I've got the, uh, the command group in with me. We've got the staff uh, behind me as well. So if there's a question that you have, uh, please don't hesitate to ask. I'm just going to go over the, these slides uh, fairly quickly. And what the intent of this is, because there's been a lot of different stories out in the media and on in the news, uh, I just want to make sure that we all give you a perspective of what we see here on the ground. Um, as you all know, I, I know that it was on your uh, minds a few days ago when we had a soldier uh, at Fort Hood that, that died that had been in Liberia. So we'll spend a little bit at the very end talking about force, force health protection. And uh, we'll finish with that slide. But before we get there, I just want to tell you kind of what we got tasked to do here, tell you where we're at and the progress that we made, and then we'll finish up with that force health protection. So if you go to the JFC uh, United Assistance Campaign Plan, um, but what, what this just does is show you how we kind of broke out our mission. We got told uh, we were going to you have to do some very specific tasks. Some of that is build a bowl of treatment units, train healthcare workers to fill those treatment units, sustain those treatment units, and then of course protect the force. Uh, we've we've been in, you see how that kind of stretched across. So those were our, what we call our lines of effort and, and surrounding all of that is, you know, mission command, command and control, that's what the division headquarters does. Uh, just so you know, you know, we got the sustainment brigade, we got the MPs, we got 86 cash from Fort Campbell, but we got engineers from Fort Hood, Fort Carson, we got folks from Fort Eustace, uh, we got aviation, uh, uh, aviation unit from Fort Bliss. So it, this is a, this is really a, a joint force from across the army and we've been getting great support from all of them. So just so you know, this isn't just 101st. We got a lot of folks from across the army that are participating. If you go to the next slide, it that's, says what we've done. So I talked a little bit about it before. You know, bullet treatment units. We got here. We got told we got to oversee the construction of 15 of these bullet treatment units all across Liberia, and that uh, we were also going to get the opportunity to sustain them. Uh, and so we did that. Uh, the last two uh, Ebola treatment units should finish uh, all their construction and be completely handed over to an, uh, an, a non-governmental organization by the end of this month. I'll tell you, when we first got here, the assessment was based on Ebola and all the work that had to be done, we might get these tasks finished from our end on uh, the 1st of April. Uh, there was no discussion about the 101st transition into any of this. It was just get these things finished and then we'll bring a force in behind you. Well, we're going to be done with all of those tasks by the 31st of January. So we, th that's going to give our, our nation and its leadership the ability to, to think through what the way ahead for Liberia will be in, in our role in it. As you saw, healthcare worker training, we, we trained over 1,500. That was the 86 cash uh, was responsible for training those. We had uh, one fixed location at the National Police Training Center uh, where they live, and then we also sent some uh, mobile training teams out into the communities where these ETUs were going to be built to train the cadre there to man, uh, to, uh, man those Ebola treatment units that were being built. We finished that on the 31st of December, training all the healthcare workers. Uh, one of the big things that, that came about was the uh, Army labs that came here. Before the laboratories came, if you took a blood sample from someone that you suspected being a patient of or, or being infected with Ebola, it could take up to four to five days to get that, that result of that blood sample. Well, because these labs are here, what used to take four or five days now, now takes three to four hours. And the impact that has had has been huge on the ability to turn the corner on Ebola infection. 
What used to happen is if someone displayed a high fever or was vomiting, they'd take them right to the ETU, take their blood sample, and because the road network was so poor, go to one location. And so those four to five days that person was waiting, they may just have had malaria. But because they were sitting in an ETU with other people that were really infected, that transmission occurred. And so now what you have, I was out at uh, the Island Clinic the other day, I was visiting our mobile lab that was out there and they were releasing 40 people out of that ETU that just had malaria or just had the flu, but never were exposed to patients in that Ebola treatment unit because the lab was able to rapidly turn that blood sample. So that's really helped get after it as well. The other piece of the sustainment, you know, we, we had to sustain with uh, protective equipment, some of the supplies that those ETUs needed all across Liberia. We turned that over to the World Food Program on the 15th of December. So when you look at those, those lines that we had to do, they're complete. And we continue to support the United States uh, Agency for International Development to continue the progress. So if you go to the next slide and say, okay, so what's that all mean? The Liberia long-term EVD trends. This is where we're at today. So you can see when we got here, sometime just after that one October uh, ban, you know, at one point they had over 82, that red line is uh, suspected or probable, the blue line is confirmed. So those people in the ETUs that were uh, probable or suspected, those were the ones waiting to get a blood sample uh, result. And that blue line are those that did in fact have it. At one point, uh, we had 82 probable or suspected uh, uh, patients, as well as 52 confirmed patients every single day in Liberia. Every day that happened. And at that point, the probable and suspected, uh, about 40 to 50% of them actually had Ebola. So when you go down to where we are today, there's less than one case of confirmed uh, someone confirmed effect, infected with Ebola every day in Liberia, one. And there's about 20 that are probable or suspected, but of those 20, only one or two are being confirmed with Ebola. So you look at where we were when we got here compared to where we are today, that's been some pretty good progress by the team and really everyone that's worked with uh, the USA and the government of Liberia. So you see on the left-hand side, you know, we first hit uh, 10 through 12 January was the first period of time that there were no cases of, or new cases of Ebola in all of Liberia. So it's been a pretty dramatic change. What, what the, the 101st and its joint force partners brought was speed, flexibility, and the ability to get to places no one else could and bring capability there so that we could get our, get our head around this problem, treat things locally to prevent people. It, it, uh, through, a few months ago, you'd have a person come out of the country of Guinea and walk south across the border, because the border is porous, that had Ebola and go to Lofa province. And that, that one province started from that one case of somebody walking out of Guinea into Lofa and had hundreds and hundreds of confirmed cases. That was the epicenter early on. Well, then you had somebody from Sierra Leone, the country to the west, walk across the border, go to Monrovia, the capital city, and start the infection here, where there were thousands of, of folks infected. So what, what are our capability of building these Ebola treatment units out in the county, one per county, has prevented people from having to walk from where they were infected all the way into the capital city and transmit that disease all the way through. That's why you see with the labs, with the ETUs and the healthcare workers, and some of the, the work the government of Liberia has done, why you see that trend line going in the positive direction. So that's, that's the so what of what your, your division's done. So you'll say, okay, that's great. Today is, you know, middle of January. So what are you telling us all the great things that uh, have happened? What's next? Go to the next slide. So where we are today. You know, we, we, we believe and our assessment has been, we've, we've accomplished the tasks that we've been given to do by our nation. And so we're ready to transition. And the plans as they currently stand are, we transition with the 34th Infantry Division who's been not, uh, announced to come uh, and be our backfill. And we work that piece for April. And we continue to, to uh, you know, get after the remaining piece of uh, uh, Ebola in Liberia. 
There is a, a course of action that says, hey, because the, the uh, situation is much, much better than we anticipated, we have nobody backfill you, and the 101st turns the lights off. So there is no backfill. So the thing the chairman talked about, a six-month, six-month, six-month rotation, it's all done in the first six months. The third one is we could have to expand our response. We are below where, we, where the Ebola trend line was in, in August. Just so, to give you some historical perspective, this is the second Ebola outbreak Liberia's had in about a calendar year. The first one was about March, you know, early February, March. It had a spike, and, then, and they thought they got their head around it, and it dropped. And, and in the end of July, it was about one case, two cases maybe. Well, they, they, didn't, they didn't keep after it. And so then it spiked dramatically up to the numbers I talked about earlier. So what we're worried about is all of the, the things that have been put into place, people get complacent, they start uh, not taking the preventative measures, and it could spike again. And that's what everybody is worried about, that this great one case a day could rapidly go to 30 or 40, which would be a requirement for us to get reengaged. Or, you know, Sierra Leone and Guinea, who are, have much worse uh, conditions at EBD than we do here in Liberia, we could be tasked, hey, go support Ebola efforts in those two, one of those two countries, if not both. So we've done planning for all three of these. And we uh, have done a, a, a briefing to AFRICOM, our higher headquarters. They've gone to Washington, D.C., and they are, they've been meeting over the last three days to determine, hey, what is the way ahead for Liberia? So we're waiting on a decision. And we think that decision is going to be made sometime between now and the 25th or 26th of January. And then when they make that decision, we'll clearly tell you what that decision is. I fully expect then we'll redeploy some people in February because their mission's done and we don't need them right now to do what we have remaining uh, if we get told to do one of these missions. So you saw four, about 450 people come home earlier. That's because we brought more people originally than we uh, needed based on the capabilities we found in, in Liberia. So you, that's why you saw them come home and they're in control monitoring now. I think the first cohort gets out about the 22nd. So the 1st of February, you'll see another uh, a group of people, the 1st and 2nd, come back so that we can continue to right-size the force and only keep the people here that we need to accomplish the mission. So that's where we're at. But under any of those three courses of action, you can expect to see the division redeploying between March and uh, early, early May. Okay, so go to the next slide, please. So we told you what our mission was, we told you what our lines of effort are, but the first and number one priority for us has always been protecting the force. And as you know, we've sent some soldiers back on emergency leave, on medical evacuation for medical issues, and knock on wood, none of them have come up with a, uh, any indications of infection. Even the soldier that passed away at Fort Hood was determined not to have Ebola. So we are, we are, I will tell you, very, very focused on ensuring that soldiers adhere to all of the protection measures we put into place. And we demand and hold our leaders accountable for that. So what have we done, as you see on this slide? Individual leader action, you know, daily temperature checks. You've heard us say it before. Everybody gets their temperature checked here twice. If it spikes above 100.4, they go right into isolation. Uh, we've had the opportunity, frankly, to rehearse that with some people that had the flu. Uh, they got to go out into the timeout box and sit there, get their temperature checked. We did a blood test, took it to the lab. They came back negative. So we've had the opportunity to do that early on once or twice. But we've continued to beat these force health protection measures to all of our soldiers. We keep a log of their temperatures uh, so that we know from the day they got here until whenever we're done, what their trend line has been. And for those of you that aren't familiar with Ebola, it's similar to HIV. You have to exchange body fluids to get it. So standing and talking to somebody two feet, three feet, four feet away, you, that's why you'll see if you go to an ETU, there's a two meter gap to prevent that space in any exchange of bodily fluids. So just being in Liberia at Barclay Training Center does not increase your risk of getting Ebola because we're very self-contained and we don't have anybody uh, anywhere near any infected patients or working in an infected, uh, in an area where there are patients there. 
So you look at no contact or treatment of patients. We've said that. We're taking our malarone. Uh, malaria is a bigger killer in Liberia than Ebola is. In fact, people throw around the last time the Marines were here, 30% of their force came down with malaria. Uh, so we are as, as uh, focused on preventing malaria as we are on uh, Ebola. Medical protocol, as you see, and then redeployment. So uh, what we do there as well. So uh, I am doing everything, we, we are all doing everything we can to make sure that the soldiers are maintaining their focus on staying healthy so our families are safe when we come back. So that's really it in a nutshell, uh, uh, kind of a one over the world. Again, I appreciate all the support from the people back home and we are ready to take your questions. Over to you. Thank you, sir. This is Colonel Gallagher. I'm on the, the, the far edge of the screen, and we've got our Facebook set up, and we started to take a few questions. But at, at this point, uh, is anyone in the audience uh, prepared to make a statement or ask a question? So, so some, I've looked at while, while people are thinking about that or maybe getting their wits about them. Could you could you cover uh, if there's been recover if necessary the controlled monitoring policy? And uh, if there's been any changes or if you expect any changes about control monitoring. Um, yeah, thanks for the, the question. <clears throat> when you leave here, the, the, the second those wheels go off the ground, your control monitoring period starts, and it's a 21-day process. So you'll go to five locations, potentially. You got Fort Eustis or JBLM Eustis, JBLM Accord, Bragg, uh, potentially Hood, and Bliss. Those are the five control monitoring areas. So we've got folks, you know, will probably be, you know, JBLM and Fort Bliss, for example, for Fort Campbell soldiers. So you're going to go there, you, you land, they take you right to the area that they're going to monitor you in, and, and they keep you pretty much isolated in that area. They feed you. There's a lot, there's MWR capabilities, so our soldiers are able to talk to their families. We're giving them some uh, Army training tasks they have to do to keep them a little bit occupied and getting ahead on the training requirements that they'll have to accomplish when they get back to home station. Um, we're doing some medical training. Some kids are doing civilian online classes, going to college, and it's really a time for them to reset. We want to get them to do some of these uh, these uh, SRP kind of tasks, and so once we get back to Fort Campbell, it goes uh, faster through that reintegration process. Uh, because we want all of them to come back and be able to take leave. That's what that's what the big focus is for us. Uh, there, the uh, OSD or DOD is looking at reevaluating re re the policy. Don't know if they're going to do that or what the results will be. But we're planning on spending 21 days at another location other than here, getting our feet back under us once we depart Liberia. Over. Roger, sir. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna just clarify what you said. Is that right now there is the, the questions that, that seem to be approaching us are: Is there anybody that's not going to do the 21 day uh, control monitoring process as of current policy right now? Over. Well, I will tell you the folks that go on emergency leave, as they come through, they they've not gone to uncontrolled. Excluding the emergency relief situation, so we're talking about for the mass. Oh yeah, we're system. all going to right now. Yeah, we're going to control monitor. Roger, sir. Just wanted to clarify that. It seems to be that, that was a lot of the questions on are the questions on Facebook uh, were, were driving towards that there's been a change in policy, and I, I think we're going to report back to all those folks. That it's still 21 days. Yeah. Uh, so if anyone, hey, Buck. If we hear any different, we'll let you know. Uh, you'll be you'll be the second one to know if I can beat the families from their soldier calling them. Now, now let's just say, for example, it does um, it does get lifted, and I'm just going to hypothetically just say let's pretend it does. We we had a soldier, as you recall, that was going back on emergency leave, and it, his family didn't feel comfortable with him coming back. So what I've told General Stammer is. We need to have an area that if a family member decides, hey, I'm just not comfortable with it, 
I'd like, I'd like, if my wife says I'm not ready for Valeski to come home yet, he needs to take a 21 day timeout because I want to feel a little more comfortable, then they're going to put me somewhere. But what, what we need to make sure we educate our families on is, hey, when we come home, we're going to make sure that their soldiers are, are, uh, are healthy and we'll take all the precautions. Uh, but if, if that thing is lifted, we'll make sure if a family member is, is not comfortable, we'll take those precautions because the most important thing for our families is that they're comfortable and confident in their safety for them and their, their families as well as their soldiers. Does that make sense? Well, I'm sure that makes sense, and uh, thanks for that assurance. And I think our community leaders would well, feel good about that as well. Any other uh, any questions at all from the group? You know, open mic. Sir, so we've probably got about uh, 40 family members here. If, uh, if there's any other than the, the presentation that you gave, gave is there, there's any messages to the, the family members and to FRF, FRG and FRSA network that you would like to relay? Uh, I would just tell them that, you know, it, it, again, you heard me start and say, I, I thank them for their support. As you'll hear me tell everybody, you know, this division, I, I got asked the other day about, well, you know, it, when you guys get back, you'll be able to take leave and, you know, relax because you'll have got a deployment under your belt. I remind them really quickly that this division was only back from Afghanistan seven months and we deployed to Liberia and that the division answers our nation's call. We couldn't do that without our families and our great communities. And uh, with, without their support, we couldn't do what we do today. And I laid that out to, to them and said, let's just look at what the 101st is doing today. You've got two brigades, you know, uh, 2nd Brigade 159 that just got back from Afghanistan. 1st Brigade's in Afghanistan, 3rd Brigade's getting ready to go, the 101st Combat Aviation Brigade will follow, and you got the Division Headquarters and the Sustainment Brigade with other folks from Fort Campbell in Liberia today. That's an example of what we're doing. So we couldn't do it without our families. And I tell you, um, if there's any issues the families have, please let us know. And we'll try to alleviate any of your concerns. Anybody else in here, Emily? <laughs> I, I just got a call or a question. It's a great one. It says, how come there's still one case per day? Why is it not going to zero? That's a great question. Um, let me paint the picture of Liberia for you. Uh, they call it the forest here. We call it a jungle. It, it is... It is triple canopy from the time you leave Monrovia. As I fly over, it takes about, to go to all four corners, I'll say three because we're on the coast. To get to the northern portion of Liberia, it takes an hour and 18 minutes to fly to Voinjama. And from the about 10 minutes outside Monrovia, it is just jungle. It takes about another two hours to go west and two hours to go east. That, that's kind of a helicopter flight of how far it is uh, in Liberia. So you've got these cases. <clears throat> the Monrovia is a city of a few million. And so the only way you really get after the Ebola is when somebody has it, you do what they call contact tracing. And you go and ask, okay, who, who have you associated with? And they got to go, they go and try to find all these people to see if they're infected so they can break the transmission cycle. So that's one piece, trying to find out who all this person is interacted with. And, and to give you a scale, they had an imam die. They moved his body through the streets to his funeral. That resulted in 2,000 contacts they had to go find. Now figure out, how, figure what it would be like just to find 2,000 people at Fort Campbell. Now, now put that in in areas all across Liberia. So that's challenging. The second piece is the cultural norms here are a little different than what we're used to. When someone dies, they wash the dead body, they touch the dead body. Well, that's the time when the body's most infectious. And so some of these cultural practices out in the rural areas haven't been changed yet. And so part of the strategy is to find out where these outbreaks are out in the hinterland, fly a capability and isolate it before it can start coming into the major urban areas. So that's the challenge with getting to zero. It is easier to get 
from 50 to 10 cases a day than it will be to go from 10 to zero. Right, sir. Uh, so, uh, Mayor Hendricks from uh, Hopkinsville has a question. Sir, it's more of a comment than a question. I just want to say thank you on, on behalf of our community for the information you're providing today and this opportunity. It certainly will help us provide any further communication that we can to lay any concerns or questions that our community members may have. And I'm sitting behind the side mayor, Jim Dern, as well, from Montgomery County. And I know he feels the same way. We just want to tell you how much we appreciate you taking time to include us in this conversation. Yeah, I appreciate you both coming. What I'd really appreciate you do, though, is putting your arms around Mark Stammer and Buck and Jeff Yeager and the team back there. Because I'll tell you, without them taking care of it, there you go. <laughs> hug it out. Hug it out. You got to hug it out. Um, because they keep us straight over here. They allow us to be able to focus and get after the results you saw because they got our backs back there and so do you. So uh, thanks for all, thanks for what you do for us and being great supporters of, uh, of us over here. Sir, that was one question from the audience. Uh, and I'm not familiar with this piece of equipment, but, but, but are the soldiers wearing a tracker and uh, where are they wearing trackers and, and what's that for? Yeah, we, we have, uh, well, everybody's not wearing a tracker. I wish I could get everybody to wear a tracker, especially my DCGS. I don't know where he's flying to half the time. No, he's taking care of me, actually. We do. We have trackers, like, when we put somebody out on the street, we put a tracker in the car so we can find out where they're at in case they get in an accident. If you think it's tough driving in places like New York or some Los Angeles, I'd ask you to please come here. Uh, my wife, I, I compared to what my wife said about her visit to Korea. She said, when you hit an intersection, you just lay on the horn and the biggest vehicle gets to pass. It's a nightmare. We don't have US soldiers by and large driving any vehicles. It's all local nationals because we would be in a constant state of accident. So our worry is some soldier gets in an accident, I can look right there, I get a call. I don't need to figure out where they're at. I know where they're at, I get a medevac there or I get a ground element right to that point of location as soon as we find out about it. I've got, a, we got trackers on our helicopters. I had to do a precautionary landing for a maintenance issue. The, the jock knew the second that helicopter landed where I was knew where the QRF had to go. We got 15 helicopters flying every single day. So that's what it, it is really uh, to ensure that if somebody gets in into an incident, I don't have to ask them, hey, where are you? We know where they're at. We can give them the assistance they need. Sir, I have another question. Uh, Mayor Hendricks, from the, from the audience, uh, you want to discuss a little bit about how soldiers are assigned duties and uh, even though some may be operating outside of their primary task, and uh, how is that getting managed in terms of security and, and other details? Uh, and this is Sergeant Major. Really, the soldiers get assigned tasks based on the uh, force protection that we have to maintain over here. <coughs> and really, the guard duty is something that all the soldiers have to do. It isn't specifically an MOS specific, but it, it's all geared around keeping us safe and healthy over here. It, and as you know, Buck, we didn't have, uh, we don't have a lot of 11 Bravos that came over here. Uh, you know, we didn't deploy any of our BCTs. We came with, you know, engineers, uh, doctors, aviators, but, you know, force protection and, you know, entry control points are everybody's job. And so if somebody says, hey, you know, I'm a, I'm a cook and I'm pulling gate guard. Well, yeah, that's what everybody gets the opportunity to do. In fact, I think I actually saw the SGA pulling gate guard over New Year's Eve. Um, so I appreciate that, Judge. So that's what we're doing. We're, and again, as you see us bring, send people home, it's because there's not a mission or a task for them to accomplish. And we don't want hundreds of soldiers just sitting around doing nothing. Thanks, sir. I think that, that, that got exactly to the intent of that question. Thanks, Sergeant Major. Uh, 
And then a question, I believe this one came off Facebook. Uh, it, I, I know you, you touched on it a bit, sir, uh, but can you expand a little bit about uh, a drawdown concept? Uh, everybody's interested in that, and, or maybe there's not been enough decisions made at this point, but would you like to address how a, a drawdown could occur between, I believe it's the zero option, uh, how that would play out uh, based on what you think you can share for the group members? Well, there haven't been any decisions made yet, um, but but what I will tell you is, um, you know, people think that if there is a zero option, um, we'll get to come home faster. What what I would tell you is, we got in, we got bases that we've got to close. I mean, unlike Iraq or Afghanistan, where your guy came in and he took over that base, well, there's nobody to replace us, which means all the infrastructure we put up and all the property that we we got to dispose of that. We got to turn it over, pack it all up. So, if, if there's no if there's no uh, follow-on force, we got to close every base. If there is a follow-on force, based on what the size determination is, they don't they may not need all of this structure that we have. So we're going to have to tear down things and close that as well. So, whatever the decision is, we'll execute with vigor. Uh, but it. it I don't want people to think that there's a zero option we're coming home tomorrow. You can only take, you know, uh, infrastructure down so quickly based on the capabilities you have in country. And we're relying a lot on contracted support to do that. And I'll give you an example. They, they just educated me. We're living in force provider 150s. Those are tent uh, package that can house 150 soldiers in tents with laundry and bath. Uh, wait, how long does that take to get down? Take down? Ten days for a one fifty. Ten days. Ten, Ten days. days. We got we got about you know two thousand people here. So that, that's ten days per each one fifty force provider. And how many can we do simultaneously, Frank? Right now one per location, and it's going to go to two per location. Yeah. So we can do about two per location simultaneously, which means I can't just unplug it and watch everything collapse and we go home. And we'll need, we'll, so we're not going to be able to put everybody on a plane right away. Does that make sense? Roger, sir. I, again, I think uh, that, in this, that answers the question sufficiently. Uh, okay. Uh, I just got a, a question handed to me, but I, I would ask you. If you want to comment, we've passed a big milestone here at Fort Campbell with 101 days of no GOB dollars. And I would ask if you want to make any comments about that to, uh, to this group, uh, sort of get my head around this new question. Well, yeah, I'm going to say a comment that no one here is going to like. I think I'm going to stay in Liberia because it, it, it seems like all the good stuff happens when I'm away. You know what I mean? Uh, I get there and we can't get past 15 days and I leave and we're already past 101. So what I tell you is 202 is a, is a great number too. So let's see if we can get there. But that's a great testament to the leadership and really our soldiers embracing what we were calling force protection. It isn't about safety, it's about protecting the force. And uh, I appreciate the families getting after it too, because I'll tell you, I know that my biggest uh, my, my biggest checker is my wife, and she's making sure I'm tracking. So I hope all the other families are doing the same thing for their soldier. But keep up the great work. Thanks, sir. Uh, we had a question on, on Facebook. Uh, we've got a lot of units over there, but how about individual augmentees? And uh, how are they being managed, and how will they be informed of their release? Or I'm not sure a lot of the augmentees question referred to individual yeah, they're going to go back and see with their units that's all right they're going to go back with their units yeah yeah i was just checking with the 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 g the rg1 they'll go back with their unit that unit will they not come on up here tell me how they'll go back i'll have a g1 answer that one yes sir this is manual can sir i will slow down uh, mainly they would go back to control monitoring with the unit and then they will revert back to the parent unit once they finish control monitoring. But as of right now, all the individual arm and teal would go uh, with CMA with the mainly LEC cash that have most of them. This includes 
Air Force, Navy, and uh, individual McTeed office doctors that came here with them, sir. So and once they get through their 21-day monitoring with that cohort they flew with, that, that senior commander at that installation works those transportation uh, modes for that cohort. So for the folks we have at Fort Bliss, we have nothing to say about that. That's done by uh, General Twitty and the team at Fort, Fort Bliss get all of those uh, folks together and they get them to their final points and destinations. So that's how the individual augmentees will roll out of a CMA. Does that make sense? Sir, can we, uh, can you tell me what that acronym CMA means? Uh, Controlled Monitoring Area. I got it, I got it. Okay, so we're tracking all that, and I think we can answer the question on that. Uh, any questions from the group here? Well, good. I don't like looking at people watching paint dry. <laughs> you know what I mean? No, sir. Uh, we, we, I tried to shame Donna in asking a question. It was to no avail, sir. <laughs> sir, we've got uh, all of our the Facebook questions are coming up that are all quite information that you covered. So, okay. so, uh, so far, with everything we need uh, to continue to answer, it looks like uh, all the information sort of anticipated it. Uh, the questions you anticipated, so we're just answering them out as they come up. Nothing that you have not already covered to this point. Over. Okay, well, then I'd like to thank again all of you for coming. I know you got another function to go, and just to, I'd ask you all to put your arms around those volunteers as well. Uh, looking forward to seeing you when we get back to Fort Campbell. I, I will tell you, you know, the summertime is a coming. We're going to have some transitions that are going to occur. So I, I'd ask us to make sure that, you know, that uh, as we start looking at units back at Fort uh, Campbell, Mark, that our transition plans are solid. You know, uh, I, I want to plug in on VTCs as much as I can to, uh, that makes sense to you on, you know, telling people or at least get a phone call into folks that are transitioning. But, you know, let's make sure we got a good tight piece on that and we get everybody integrated. But I appreciate all you all do. Any save rounds? Any save rounds from here? Sir, we got one burning question. I think I know what the answer is. Who's your Super Bowl pick? <laughs> I think it's the Packers. Go Hawks! Yeah, all I got to say... Hey, yeah, I just say that, you know, don't hate the player, hate the game. Go Pack, go! They're like, who? <laughs> All right, be good. All right, sir. We'll see y'all later. Have a great evening.